Recently I was made aware of a super useful website, and maybe I'm alone here, and everybody else already knew about it, but if you didn't, hopefully you can get something useful out of it. Are you ever confused about end of life dates for various products you have? You know the date is out there somewhere, but you have no idea what page it's on. If you do find the page, it's confusingly laid out and has information that contradicts with other information and it's just a giant mess. Well, what you can do is come over to endoflife.date, an open source collection that anybody can go and contribute to of end of life dates for a ton of different products. Currently it's tracking 253, but this is going to cover a lot of the main things that people are looking for. Say you want to know the end of life date for a version of Linux Mint for example. Well, Mint right here. Say you're running 21 Vanessa. This was released one year and one month ago. It currently has active support and security support ends in three years and six months. Say you have you know, this version here, version 20, released three years ago, and this one currently doesn't have active support, but does still have security support. Okay, let's try out something like a Kindle. Here we go, here's all of the devices that are currently supported, scrolling down, and down here it tells you when that support actually ended. So you want to look at something like a operating system like Windows. Well, all of these versions of Windows 10 and Windows 11 are currently being supported, this one here, its support recently ended about three months ago. Let's try out something like a web browser, Firefox for example. Here we go, 117 is getting security support, it was released on this date, this version here, not currently being supported. But you can go with 115 ESR, or how about say, FreeBSD. Here we go, all of the exact same information, so on and so forth. Along with when necessary, additional information explaining things that can't directly be explained in a chart. For example, on Ubuntu, with their release cadence, their support cycle, their support comparison, and then all of these caveats for things that aren't explained, things that had different names, things that just are not really that clear. Along with things like the Linux kernel, with a sort of a expected release, but when it comes to how long things are going to be supported for, those dates are not set in stone. All of that by itself is great for the user, but what if I want to go and take this information and use it in some other format? Well, luckily, they include API endpoints. So if I go and do slash API slash Linux dot JSON, it includes all of that table information now just in a JSON format. Just imagine how much better everything would be if every website provided their release information in a JSON format like this. If they don't want to give it to you in a good format on their website, you can just go and do something useful with it yourself. Honestly, if they did that, half the development of this website just wouldn't need to exist. A lot of it is just building tools to scrape the release website and get this information into an actual usable format that can be consumed by a person. Just not even a person that is like good at reading tables, just a human. And if you like what this project is doing and you want to get involved with it, all of this stuff is really well documented, at least the stuff on their side. Outside of that, well, that's where the challenge sort of comes in. But how to actually work with the project, all that stuff, very well documented here, and it should be pretty easy to wrap your head around. But maybe you don't want to work directly in this project and maybe you want to work in a way that makes basically everybody's lives easier. Say you're at one of these companies that has end of life documentation. The page I would recommend you checking out is the recommendations. This is a page showing how end of life dates should actually be presented. Obviously there's going to be some bias towards the way that they want to work here, but most of the recommendations they make are just generally applicable outside of what they're trying to do with this website. Starting with publishing. For a large project, especially a project that might have many sub-projects, you might need to split up your information across multiple pages. If you do that though, these documents should be well linked and hosted together. For example, do not keep your versioning policy in your wiki and your end of life policy on your website. Basically, 
Don't Be Ubuntu, which has their release cadence on their wiki, release cycle on their website, and then releases on another page of the wiki, all of which are presenting the information in a completely different way. This one has this like image flowchart sort of thing. Here we have a more consumer facing bit of documentation. We have another graph. The graph looks entirely different. And this one, we have a giant table. If it is possible, a single document is preferred, like the way it is done for Angular, where you have all of the things you need to know about versioning and releases on the Angular releases page. Nothing else on some other page somewhere. It is just all here. This document should be on your website or your wiki, but it is also nice to include something in the repository as well. Now, obviously, if we're talking about like an Amazon Kindle, there is no repository for this, so the website is the best place for it. And that page it's on should be a stable URL and shouldn't be versioned. So you shouldn't have docs slash 3.4 slash EOL. It should be docs EOL. Basically, don't do what Ansible is doing. We have 2.9 releases, latest releases, devel releases. Why do you need all of these pages? Just put it onto one page. This version release information causes confusion, as users on the 2.9 branch might miss out on important information that is reflected on the latest version. This can be managed in a not super annoying way. But that's too much hassle, just don't do it. Also, EOL information shouldn't be hidden away in your developer documentation, like it is for Python. Why is this not on the main Python website? Why do I need to go to devguide.python.org? I didn't even know this page existed until I saw it linked on this website. Next step, document your support lifecycle. Your support lifecycle is your guidance on how long each product will be supported. If you have LTS, long-term support releases, clarify how this differs for those. So don't do what Ubuntu does, where it doesn't actually tell you how long the release cycle is. It gets you to do some maths looking at this graph. Like I can see it goes to this date, but just tell me the end date. Next up is release cadence. Not every project has a stable release cadence. Not every project is like Ubuntu where every six months there is going to be a new Ubuntu release. But if you have one, even a rough one, document it. It is always better if your release cadence is predictable and aligned with your support life cycles. A good example of this being Alpine Linux, where it says this right here, there are several release branches for Alpine Linux available at the same time. Each May and November, we make a release branch from Edge. All of that, completely reasonable. The main repository is typically supported for two years, and the community repository is supported until next stable release. This can change depending on the individual releases, but having some sort of rough guideline at least gives you an idea about what's going on. Many projects out there simply don't have a release schedule, but a lot of those projects also don't publish end of life dates. Usually the end of life is when the next version comes out. So for those, it's not really a concern. Next up, actually explain what is being supported. Every project will have different levels of what counts as support. It is important to document what support means for your project. If there are different tiers, say active, security, extended, for example, document these clearly. So a bad example is extended support beyond LTS is available to customers on a commercial basis. Okay, so what is included there? Does it include security fixes? Does it include bug fixes? Does it, does it include new features? Does it include all repositories or any of the main repositories? Like what is actually being included here? A good example is extended support beyond LTS is available to customers on a commercial basis. It includes critical security fixes only on packages within the base repository. Customers paying for premier support get additional access to our support team with a guaranteed SLA. This is one of the very few times that Ubuntu actually does a good job. And I think the reason it does a good job is because this is the sort of 
business to business documentation. On Ubuntu LTS, the main version that everybody gets, the packages in Ubuntu main repository for five years, and then best effort on Ubuntu Universe. Then with Ubuntu Pro Infra only, previously known as Ubuntu Advantage for Infrastructure, once again, explaining what the previous name was, this you get 10 years on Ubuntu Main and best effort on Ubuntu Universe. Then with Ubuntu Pro, it is 10 years in both categories. Plus there is this amusing graphic which I guess demonstrates how much better Ubuntu Pro is. On Ubuntu LTS, you get this tiny little orange bar, but with Ubuntu Pro, look at this giant black rectangle you get. It's so much better. The table is good enough, and if this graphic was missing, nothing of value would be lost. Next is versioning policy. Document your versioning policy. Even if the policy is homebrew and varies between major versions, a clearly documented policy is better than none. My favorite policy is the Linux kernel, where Linus Torvalds doesn't like a big minor number, so when the number gets too big, he increments the major number. I'm not joking, that's why we're on the 6.0 series. Release notes. We all love release notes. Actually make them. And if there's some sort of migration guide between, say, 2.3.7 and 2.4 or whatever the version number sort of system is, actually document how to do that migration. Not just the case where everything's working like it should be, but also try to address cases where maybe someone's doing something a bit weird and it needs some extra migration steps. Another thing you should do is actually list your releases in a way that is actually useful. Link to release notes. Clearly show what is the latest release and what releases are still being supported. Delineating that with the releases that are legacy releases, including important dates. A download link if necessary. A migration guide if necessary and available. Basically, don't do what Python does. The Python page is a giant mess. So we have a button here to download the latest version. Good, okay? One thing, fine. Active Python releases. 3.12, 3.11, 3.10, 3.9, 3.8. Okay, so all of those are still active. But what if we go to looking for a specific release? So at what point do these stop being supported? Is 3.10.1 from 2021 still supported? It says this is an active Python release, so like, is that fine? But also, this includes all the way back to Python 2.0. Should I be downloading that? Why is it not in a separate list that is just containing legacy releases? But they do something else on this page. They have the release date in an absolute date, and then do this. 2027.10. Is that the start of October? Is that the end of October? Is that the middle of October? At what point in October is this the end of the support period? Don't do this. Actually use absolute dates. Many times your support slash end of life policies are relative. Common examples, the last major release becomes unsupported 90 days after a new major release. Bug fixes on previous releases will be made till the latest releases get the first point release. But the users shouldn't have to do maths. Make sure that all your releases always have clear dates. I suggest year, month, day. You know, if Americans didn't exist and didn't use month, day, year, I would say day, month, year is also fine. But considering that they do exist, yeah, this is probably the better option. And finally, as an optional thing, have a graphic. Make sure the axes are clearly labeled. There is a straight line mark in the current date. If you can make it interactive, provide a start and end date on hover. Make sure these images are kept updated. This is the big reason why you might not want to do it. Because if you let it drift, it becomes worse than useless. And ensure that all data in the image is also reflected in text. For accessibility reasons, but also, I don't want to read an image. Just let me see it in a table. So there are some good examples of this, like PHP, for example, where you have the information you need and nothing else. Django, also information you need, nothing else. Now, NVIDIA's is... 
NVIDIA's, I guess. It works, like, if you look at it for maybe five, ten minutes, you can work out what's going on. But I feel like some of this stuff doesn't need to be here. You would think that showing end-of-life dates is pretty easy to get right. And I would say it probably is as well. But a lot of people just get it wrong. And a lot of these projects have had it wrong for so long that it's probably never going to be fixed. But if you're in a position to fix one of these projects, please go ahead and at least suggest something. So let me know. Did you know about this website? Are you in a position where you're maintaining a fairly large project, or at least somewhat involved with it, that actually has end of life dates? And maybe that information could be provided in a better and more friendly way to the users. I would love to know. So if you like this video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become a one over, these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon scribe so Libero pay linked in the description down below. That's gonna be it for me, and this video is EOL.